Joining me now from Los Angeles is Phil Wilson. Now, Phil was diagnosed with HIV back in the 1980s. He lost his partner to the disease. He's also an activist and founded the Black AIDS Institute. Phil, take me back in time. I've heard you talk about this. It starts with swollen lymph nodes, and a lot of times you can just have a cold or a sinus infection. So tell me what it was like going in there and finding out that that was not what was wrong with you. Well, you know, the thing about acute HIV infection is that it looks like and feels like a lot of things. It, it feels like the flu or any number of things. And for a number of reasons, for these reasons, people often are misdiagnosed or they delay getting diagnosed. For me, uh, it was in the early, early, early days of the epidemic, and all we really knew is that it had something to do with swollen lymph nodes. Uh, my partner at the time had swollen lymph nodes. I had swollen lymph nodes. We actually went in and did a biopsy, uh, but at the time, there wasn't much information available. Now, now, fast forward a few years later, 1986, there's now an HIV test available, and we both go in to get tested for HIV and discover that we're both living with HIV uh, at that time. By then, he had full-blown AIDS. And did it feel like a death sentence back then? I mean, a lot of people, when they heard the news, it, it was not good. I mean, you, the, the, the prognosis for surviving for a lengthy period of time, that, didn't, that wasn't, I mean, Phil Wilson at that it, stage probably didn't think he'd be talking to me in 2013, I wouldn't think. Absolutely not. It was a death sentence in the early, early days. Everyone that uh, we knew who was diagnosed with AIDS, because this is, there was very little about HIV at the time, actually died. A long-term survivor in 1982 to 1986 was someone who lived 24 months. And so when I found out that I was HIV positive, even though I was very educated about HIV and AIDS at the time, for the time, I absolutely thought that it was a death sentence. I thought that my life was over, uh, even though I suspected that I had HIV because, like I said, my partner had full-blown AIDS. Uh, the difference between suspecting that you were infected and actually knowing that you were infected was like night and day. How crushing was that news? It was extremely crushing. I remember going out to my car and sitting in my car and just spinning and, and really just breaking down because, like I said, I thought that my life was over. Now, one of the things that, for me, that happened is that you know, my friends all over, all around me, were also getting the same news, and a number of our friends at the time were already on their deathbed, and my partner was critically ill at the time. And so maybe one of the saving graces, I don't know, is that I didn't have time to wallow in my own uh, pity, if you will, because there was work to be done. And many of us back then, you know, immediately went to work to take care of our friends uh, and loved ones. Let me ask you, I want to get your thoughts on an interview I did back in the late 1990s. I interviewed this doctor, and, and uh, she had a full regiment of patients who had HIV. And she was retiring, and she was probably in her early 40s. And I asked her why, and she said, you have no idea the toll this takes on you. She goes, I can't begin to tell you the litany of funerals I've attended. I can't begin to tell you how many patients were abandoned by their families once they learned that they were gay and they had AIDS. And she goes, so then I became their family and then I had to go to those funerals. She goes, the compassion fatigue is immense. And I know you're in the community and you talked about your, your partner and there had to be other loved ones in that community who died as well. Can you talk to me about that aspect of this journey for you? Absolutely. From 1982 to 1990, no, I probably lost upwards to 100, 150 friends, family, loved ones, uh, people who I knew um, you know, during that, that period of time. Uh, at a certain point, really, literally almost everyone, almost every you know, gay man in my Rolodex um, had died. And you know, the good news is that we got through that. I think that a lot of us, you know, quite frankly, are suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome, syndrome because it is like you know, surviving a war. Uh, and, um, but it was devastating because you know, there were times when you would visit someone in the hospital in the morning and then you would go visit someone in the hospice in the afternoon and you would check someone into the emergency room in the you know, early evening and you would attend a memorial service that night. You know, that's what our days were like in the early days. Um, thank God that is not where we are today. 
We've made a lot of tremendous progress, uh, and we have the possibility of ending the AIDS epidemic if we do what is necessary. Let me ask you a couple more questions because we're just about out of time, but I want to touch on this. You founded the Black AIDS Institute, and you purposely put that name in there, and you t I've heard you say this is a black disease. Can you talk to us about that? Absolutely. Black Americans represent 10 to 12 percent of the U.S. population, and yet we represent nearly 50 percent of the HIV AIDS cases in this country. And there is no way that we are going to be able to end AIDS in America if we're not successful at ending AIDS in black America. It's important uh, that we focus our energies on where the epidemic is. And today, the epidemic is primarily in black and brown communities and poor communities. We have a rising epidemic among women uh, and a rising epidemic among young people. Uh, but it is important that we look at those people most impacted. And in America today, those are black and brown. You said young people. Uh, those young people didn't grow up going through what you went through. Because HIV and AIDS have changed over time, because treatments have changed over time, have behaviors changed over time, and is that alarming to you? Well, certainly behaviors are, have changed over time for the better, but not enough. No, and I think that where we are in 2013, going into 2014, is that we have to keep our eyes on the prize. We have the tools to end the AIDS epidemic. We have better diagnostic tools. We have better treatment tools. We have better prevention tools. We have better surveillance tools. But we have to use those tools, and we have to remember and to remind ourselves every day that the epidemic is not over. Uh, and we're not going to get to the end game unless we focus and we invest our energies where we need to today. Phil Wilson, thank you so much for your time and your story. Thank you.